Many people today remember the Ottoman Empire as the sick man of Europe, an epithet the collapsing empire earned during the 19th and early parts of the 20th century. The description was no doubt correct during the period it was invented. However, it is also misleading, as throughout most of its existence, the Ottomans were a formidable power, whose strength was feared in Europe and the Middle East. The strength of the Ottoman Empire was built on multiple pillars, and each of these was able to strike fear into the hearts of the enemies of the Sultan. Yeah. Stick around to find out what these pillars were, and please like and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this. Medieval and early modern Europe was mostly ruled by dynastic states. In this regard, the Christian Habsburg Empire differed little from the Ottoman Empire. A great difference between the Habsburgs and the Ottomans, however, was the method of succession. Throughout most of Christian Europe, the eldest son of a ruler stood to inherit his position and the power that came with it. When the eldest son predeceased the ruler, it could be the male descendants of the eldest son, if there were any, the other sons, if there were, brothers or even uncles of the ruler who could claim the throne. Successions were often messy and contested, but generally there was a clear candidate whose claim was backed by the laws of the country. Ottoman successions differed greatly from the successions of Christian Europe. Succeeding the Sultan in the female line was inhibited, but other than this rule, there seemingly were no other rules. All of the sons of the Sultan were potential heirs, and even the youngest could ascend the throne, provided he was able to defeat his brothers. The lack of clear rules led to many succession crises in the Ottoman Empire. The sons of Bayezid I fought each other for 11 years between 1402 and 1413 after their father died, while the early reign of Bayezid's grandson Murad II was also plagued by civil war when he had to fight his uncle and his younger brother to solidify his grip on power. To prevent further civil wars, Mehmet the Conqueror decreed that in the future, the prince that ascends to the throne of the empire is allowed by law to execute his brothers and nephews, thus preventing even greater bloodshed that could erupt in a potential civil war. The practice was undoubtedly a brutal one, leading to the death of many innocent princes. The most brutal example was the ascension of Mehmed III, who ordered 19 of his brothers to be killed and succeeded only to a limited extent to prevent civil war, as the sons of Mehmed the Conqueror fought each other when he died in 1481, while the sons of Suleiman the Magnificent did not even wait until their father died to take up arms against each other. But at least most of the sultans who ascended after Mehmed II were quite capable men. The practice of fratricide came to an end in 1603 when Ahmed I spared his brother Mustafa. Historians come up with several explanations for this mercy, but the most likely one is that when Ahmed I took the throne, he was only a boy of 13, with no sons of his own, so if Mustafa was executed, the Ottoman dynasty would have been down to the Sultan. Had Ahmed I turned out to be infertile or fallen victim to sickness or assassination, the dynasty would have gone extinct, which in turn could have led to a civil war or even the collapse of the empire. After the rule of Ahmed I, the practice of fratricide was abandoned. However, in many regards, fratricide turned out to be superior to what followed it. Starting with the reign of Ahmed, the Ottoman princes were kept under luxurious house arrest in Constantinople, with little to do until their ascension, if the day came. Unsurprisingly, the quality of the sultans dropped sharply after the rule of Ahmed I, and few capable rulers emerged after his death. Having capable rulers like Mehmed II, Selim I, or Suleiman the Magnificent played no small part in the rise of the Ottomans. But as all good military leaders, these men also needed capable soldiers to execute their orders. The cavalry made up the biggest part of the Ottoman armies, but unlike in most contemporary armies, in the Ottoman army, it was the infantry, the famous Janissaries, that were the elite core of the army. Historians believe that the Janissaries were formed during the reign of Murad I. Initially, their numbers are believed to have been quite low, around a thousand soldiers, and they served as the Sultan's bodyguards. But as the decades and centuries passed, the Janissari Corps was expanded to around 8,000 under Mehmed II, 13,000 under Suleiman the Magnificent, and 37,000 under Ahmed I. 
Up to the 17th century, when the corps was dramatically expanded, new recruits were procured through the Devshirme child levy system, which saw the Ottoman state forcibly enroll young Christian boys into the army and administration of the empire. The boys were procured while they were still young, converted to Islam, and placed to live with a Muslim family for a while, and then trained rigorously in the usage of arms, so by the time they became adults, the Janissaries were formidable soldiers who proved their worth on numerous occasions, like the Battle of Varna or Mohaks, when the Hungarian attacks floundered when they came up against the Janissaries. Up to the reign of Selim II, historians believe the Janissaries were like the Ottoman version of the Knights Templar, as they were not allowed to marry or hold other occupations making them solely loyal to the Sultan and only him. Things started to change with the rule of Selim II as he and his successors gradually laxened the rules of the corps, allowing the Janissaries to marry, take up other occupations, and eventually allowed them to enroll their sons and relatives into the corps, leading to a marked decrease in the efficiency of the corps after the 17th century. Osman II was already unhappy with the Janissaries and planned to reform the army, but the Janissaries murdered him when they found out his intentions. Osman II was not the last sultan who was later deposed by the Janissaries either, as other reform-minded sultans like Selim III and viziers fell victim when the Janissaries felt that the reformists were threatening their privileged position. A common cliché of history, and even modern politics, is that autocracy, when the state has a capable ruler, is a very efficient form of government, as it allows the ruler to make decisions quickly and efficiently. Absolute power was rather the exception than the norm in medieval and early modern Europe, as parliaments often resisted kings and emperors. In Catalonia or Hungary, the king even had to swear upon the constitution to uphold the laws of the country, but no such checks hampered the Ottoman sultans, whose word was law, and he was judge and jury in the same person. Mehmed II was the first man to have a grand vizier put to death, while Selim the Grim was known for going through officials very quickly, and receiving a promotion from him was like a slow death sentence. Even his more moderate and fair-minded son, Suleiman the Magnificent, had his grand vizier and best friend, Pargali Ibrahim Pasha, executed, and his eldest son, Prince Mustafa, also fell victim to Suleiman's executioners. This practice of killing high officials went on for quite some time, as even even in 1683, after his defeat at the gates of Vienna, Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa Pasha was executed on the orders of the Sultan. Eventually, this practice mellowed and the Grand Viziers were rather exiled to some faraway province rather than executed, like the unfortunate Baltaji Mehmed Pasha in 1711, who was forced to spend the last months of his life in exile on the island of Lesbos. The Janissaries were the most famous slaves of the Sultan, but they were far from being the only ones. Although the Ottomans signed countless peace treaties with their neighbors, the borders of the Ottoman Empire, at least in the early centuries, were often never fully at peace. The years of peace usually meant that the Sultan or his viziers were the ones not leading great armies against their neighbors, but it was rather the subordinates and vassals of the Sultan whose power base was near the frontier who led raids into enemy territory, looting, burning, and pillaging their way until their wagons or ships were full and departed for home. On the Hungarian borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, the years of peace were rather called the years of the small war, as this period was marked by raids and counter-raids on the border areas. On the Hungarian border, local commanders often tried to capture the high-ranking officers of the enemy to ransom them back for a fortune if the other side was willing to pay the asked sum. To buy back one's freedom was certainly a humiliation, but at least a possibility for those who had the means. Unfortunately, most people were not so lucky, and the majority of the people captured by the Ottomans or their Tatar and North African vassals were sold in the slave markets of the empire. Slave labor played a crucial part in the functioning of the navies of the Sultan. It was still the Ord Galley that was the main ship used by the Ottomans and their vessels, and unsurprisingly, free men seldom volunteered to make up the manpower needed by the fleet. So the benches of the Ottoman galleys were packed with galley slaves, a very big percentage of them being captured Christians. Slaves also played an important role during land warfare, as slaves built the camps and dug the trenches during sieges also, their lives being far more expendable than that of the Janissaries or Spahis. 
Last but not least, slaves were also used as domestic servants, concubines, or guards by the elite of the Ottoman Empire, most famous of them all in the imperial palace of the Sultan. Unlike the princes of Christian Europe, the Ottoman sultans preferred to reproduce their dynasty through concubines rather than wives, though some sultans grew so fond that they married their favorite concubines. These concubines were the personal slaves of the Sultan, and after their arrival at the Imperial Palace, they were educated and trained to be able to please the Sultans. These women were to spend the rest of their lives in the seclusion of the palace, and were to come into contact with no other man than the Sultan and the palace guards. These, however, were eunuchs. Eunuchs were already used by the Byzantine Imperial Court, and the Ottomans also decided to employ many eunuchs as palace guards and courtiers. Though many men looked down on eunuchs, believing them effeminate and unmanly, their lack of ability to reproduce was seen as an advantage by the ruler, as with no family of their own, the eunuchs were loyal to him, and him only. In theory, anyway, as historians believe that some of the eunuchs maintained their contact with their old families. Thanks to their proximity to the Sultan, many concubines and even eunuchs gained great power and influence for a long period of time. The Sultan's mothers even became the de facto rulers of the Ottoman Empire, the Sultanate of Women, while the chief black eunuch of the Imperial Harem also often became one of the most influential men in the capital, as it was through him that people were able to reach out to the increasingly more secluded Sultans.